Welcome everyone to Couch Potato Diary. It is a day after the long weekend. Thank you very much for tuning in today. My name is Peter Klein. You can find me on social media, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. I'm at Primetime Klein, twitch.tv slash primetime PK. You can email the show, Couch Potato Diary at yahoo.com. Coming up on the program today, uh, we focus on some of the big stories from the National Football League. We get ready for week six in fantasy football. We look at the bad fantasy football team that probably would have beat yours, and we get into some hockey talk before we close with today's ticket. Uh, if you're watching the video, like and subscribe. Um, if you are uh, listening, subscribe to the channel and uh, leave a rating. All that stuff really does help. All right, let's get into it as we take a look at the National Football League. All right, we begin in the NFL, and we'll talk on Sunday Night Football with the San Francisco 49ers, an absolute destruction of the Dallas Cowboys. And this was such a clear victory that it affects the tiers in the NFL. The Dallas Cowboys drop from that top tier down to the second tier, at least. Um, and San Francisco is so clearly above most of the rest, I think, in the NFC. Um, I think it's them, I think it's the Eagles, and it's everyone else. Um, it's just, that ain't it for, for Dallas. They weren't close. Um, it was so, so clear, right from the word go, who was the better football team in this game, and it was so clear that it was San Francisco. Just an absolute annihilation of the San Francisco 49ers, or by the San Francisco 49ers of the Cowboys. On offense, San Francisco got everything they wanted. Um, George Kittle, open for touchdowns. Brock Purdy, great touch on some passes and spreading the, the ball around. Running the ball, they, they were able to do it. Uh, well, we'll get into it with um, the bad foot fantasy football team uh, a little bit later, but Jordan Mason was a bowling ball in this game. Like, just anything they wanted to do, they could do it. Um, just a, a phenomenal, phenomenal performance. And then on defense, they had Dak just looking like an amateur out there all night. And um, the, the pass rush was there. The coverage was great. Like, every... Every aspect of the sport, the San Francisco 49ers thrived in on Sunday night. Just a phenomenal performance. And it has led to a lot of discussion about both quarterbacks. We'll start with Dallas, because that's where we're at right now here. That was really bad from Dak Prescott. And it has come to a point now where it so clearly looks like he's not the guy to guide this team to a, a championship. He is better than a lot of quarterbacks that are out there, but... He is, he's not the guy here for, for Dallas. They, and look, they're probably stuck with him for a while. He's probably not going anywhere. Um, but this was just a really, really bad performance. And when you think of the time, like th there have been times where he's elevated this team, but we, we've talked before about the, the Daniel Jeremiah, Bucky book, uh, Brooks conversation on move the sticks. Are you a truck or are you a trailer? Dak Prescott is a trailer and he's going from a high end trailer to eh, used. It, it's it's really bad. And this, it, just as a whole, like, play calling I thought was bad. Um, a whole lot of it was bad out in, in Dallas. Uh, just, they were outcoached. They were outperformed in every aspect. And now, you have to look at this Cowboys team as one where, if they have a significant talent advantage, sure, they'll beat the crap out of you. But if it's even close to being even, they are so undermanned, it's not... It's just not going to be close. Um, on the San Francisco side, we're going a bit far on Brock Purdy. I saw that he is the betting favorite now to win most valuable player. And I understand part of that is just like where the market's going to be. But people are, are buying into it. He's not that guy. He is not best quarterback in the league or anything like that. What he is is phenomenal for this system and just a touch more than a system quarterback, I think. Um, there, there was, I saw the one thing, I think it was Rex Ryan. You put Mac Jones in this offense. Mac Jones is looking like that. No, he's not. Um, we'll, we'll talk about it later. Mac Jones has been putrid. Like it, it does take a, a pretty good quarterback to, to fit in this. He is thriving and excelling and doing everything you would want. Um, MVP? No, but excellent, excellent quarterback in this role. Absolutely. 100%. Uh, the Buffalo Bills were the weird one. They drop it to the Jacksonville Jaguars. I think pretty clearly the strategy of going out there and spending like 50 hours in England was not the move. The, the they, they were just not they weren't ready for this game. Um, so because of that, I don't take a whole lot out of this one from a Dallas perspective. You have major concerns about this defense now, though, because of another injury. This time it's Sonny Milano uh, going down with an injury. 
And it, it is, it's rough. It's really rough out there for, for Buffalo as the injuries continue to pile up. I would be expecting this team to make some kind of a move here in the next couple of weeks, looking to address that in the, the trade market. I don't know what is potentially out there. And NFL trades can be really, really weird, but I, I would expect that that is the type of move that gets made here in the next little while. Um, on the Jacksonville side, they desperately needed this game. Boy, that's a big win for them to, to, to get that one and hang in in what looks like a wildly competitive AFC South. It's still not, I, I think, I, I don't think it makes up for some of the sins of the past, but that's a, that's a strong win for Jacksonville. Uh, the Lions hype is getting a little out of control for me. They beat Carolina, and I'm seeing a lot of people putting them in like the second tier in the NFC. This is still a good football team. Make no question about it. I just think we're getting a little bent out of shape on Detroit. And I maybe some of it is I'm just slow on the uptake with this Detroit team, but to have them in like close to the elite tier in the NFC is too much, in my opinion. The Dolphins get back on track. They did, again, offensively anything they wanted. That offensive line just wins every time out. Uh, well, most of the times out. Like, Tua was under pressure at some points. And Tua, I didn't even think, had a particularly strong game. There was a couple of passes that you, you just shouldn't make. But this offense is so prolific that they can just make up for it. And the Giants are so bad that the Dolphins were able to, to make up for it. Um, the honeymoon phase is over in New York. Fans are already pissed at Brian Dayball, just five games removed from a postseason berth, but it looks really, really awful out in New York right now. The Patriots have collapsed. Um, that was a dreadful performance. That was easily, easily the worst performance of the weekend by any team in the NFL. Um, it looks lifeless. It looks uninspired. They look defeated before the game even starts. Uh, just a pathetic, pathetic performance from the New England Patriots. I don't know if you fire Bill Belichick. Any other coach would have been fired. Like, the, these last two losses that you have had, any other coach, well, not, not any, Andy Reid wouldn't have been fired, but most coaches are getting fired after that. Like, th this has been an abysmal performance from the New England Patriots. They are getting no sympathy from the rest of the NFL, that's for darn sure, but holy crap, is it bad out in New England right now. They look like one of the worst teams in the league. Um, Mac Jones... Um, I've been telling you guys for years, he's not the guy and he has now been showing you that he is not the guy in New England. They got nothing around him, but he is not doing anything to elevate anyone on that New England Patriots team. Um, the most frustrating loss of the weekend was the Baltimore Ravens. That was one of the picks that we clicked coming out of, uh, fights in football Friday this week. Holy crap, was that frustrating because they should have handed the Pittsburgh Steelers their lunch um, with the amount of drops, um, a couple in the end zone. Um, I think it was, was it Bateman who was open? Bateman either dropped the end zone one or he was wide open over the middle of the field and then just fell. Um, but just chance after chance after chance and then eventually Pittsburgh was able to hang around and get the win. I come away from this game no more impressed with Pittsburgh than I entered it and I come away from this game no more down on the Ravens than I entered it. I, I still think that's a game that if you play it almost the exact same way, uh, the Ravens win that one nine times out of ten. It, it just didn't go their way in a, a rough one against the Pittsburgh Steelers, but I, I still think that there's a lot there with the Ravens. One of the games that I was really impressed with was the Philadelphia Eagles. They pick up a win against the Rams, and they are adjusting to how the league is defending them. They A lot of teams now going two high safeties back, so they're just going to go with the underneath stuff. They ran the ball effectively, and they went to Dallas Goddard. Dallas Goddard fantasy owners mm, are going to be rather excited about this because I think that this is the start of a new offense with uh, a new offensive philosophy for the, the Eagles where they're going to be a little bit more patient and not looking for the, the big home run on every single play. I think they showed this week that they are going to be able to do that rather successfully. I thought the Rams played well, but Philadelphia's, uh, specifically the front se uh, front seven, just showed up in the second half and and really took that game over. But the Rams are going to beat a lot of teams this year. Um, they, they are certainly going to be moving up even after a loss in the power rankings. Uh, the Bengals offense looks back on track. That was a really, like, it's against Arizona, so let's not overreact too, 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 too much. But it just looked better. Like, they, they come out and start the second half with the deep ball to Jamar Chase. Because there, there was some points where it was still looking pretty conservative. And they were still not looking overly confident in Joe Burrow. But there was at least signs. He stood in the pocket, throwed it, uh, throwed it, wow, threw it deep to Jamar Chase for a touchdown. Um, he had time to kind of get second, third progressions. He was moving around 
at least a little bit in the pocket there. It was not vintage Joe Burrow, but this is not a Cincinnati team that is one going to be competitive with the worst teams in the league. They are, are they a playoff team? I still don't think so, but they're at least not going to be absolutely putrid this season. Speaking of absolutely putrid, holy shit, that Jets-Broncos game was one of the worst sporting things you could watch Ever. They were in a competition to see who could call the worst plays and execute in the, the worst fashion. Um, I heard a stat on the, the Bet the Board podcast. The um sorry, the Jets and the Broncos combined for one pass that reached the red zone or reached the end zone coming from the red zone. Neither team was taking shots, neither team like it, it was just ugly, ugly, ugly football. Both these teams cemented their place as two of the worst teams in the National Football League. Um, it was just, it was awful. It was, we were worse people for having seen it. So that is the story from the NFL this week. Let's talk some fantasy football. Let's look at the waiver wire this week. Uh, we will start at quarterback. Um, the quarterback options that are leaving off of bye not going to hurt you too much. It's Pittsburgh and Green Bay, uh, Kenny Pickett and Jordan Love, who um, I haven't gone through the Monday night game yet, but that's a bad loss for the Packers, man. That's a really, really bad loss for the Packers. That is not a great look for our NFC North bet with the uh, the, the Packers to, to win that division. But um, anyway, so maybe it, you're, you're not looking to replace a strong quarterback on bye, but if you're in the, the streaming world, Baker Mayfield, 19% owned, I still think if you're not Carolina, you can put up some fantasy points against the Carolina Panthers defense. Um, that is, I, I think, pretty clear to, to me. Or, sorry, against the Detroit Lions defense. They're playing Detroit this week. If you're not Carolina, you can put up points against that team. So I I, I think that like Baker only being 19% owned, people just aren't paying attention. Um, that This Tampa Bay team is good. This offense is good. And Baker's going to have a good fantasy week this week coming up against Detroit. Couple of running backs to watch for. Justice Hill, 28%. Oh, and that really surprises me. He just looks like the best running back out in Baltimore right now. Ty J Spears, they, they are now drawing up plays for this kid. It's not just, oh, he's in for Derek. Well, let's just run for him anyway. They are designing things for him. That run to the outside where they do the a quick little double reverse and then he cut it around. He just outran everyone. There is a speed and explosion with his game that I really like. Um, so he is going to be someone that I think you need to target coming up here because I think he's only going to have more and more value as this season goes along. Jeff Wilson's coming back from Miami. As you guys know, if you're watching the, the mock drafts at the start of the season, he was someone who I was targeting with late round picks. He is probably going to come back off of the IR this week, and I think he is going to hold a valuable role with the, this Miami Dolphins team, especially with Devon HN going off with an injury. Um, at wide receiver, it is KJ Osborne with um, Justin Jefferson going down with an injury. Osborne factored into the offense quite a bit. I think Addison's going to be still like kind of a big play guy, but down to down, I think you're going to see a lot of opportunities for KJ Osborne. And Josh Downs is factoring more and more into the Colts offense. He seems to be a bit of a safety blanket. Um, especially like Gardner, Gardner Minshew included him a lot in the, the passing attack when he came in. Gardner, I would imagine, gets the start this week. And I, I think Josh Downs has the opportunity to have some value in fantasy football. At tight end, I still don't know how this guy is only 15% owned. It's Logan Thomas. He has had immense value, I think. He's getting a lot of looks, a lot of targets going his way on a Washington offense that isn't dreadful. So I, I like Logan Thomas in a number of different spots. Those are your fantasy football waiver wire options. Let's get into the bad fantasy football team that might have beat yours. Every week we are reminded how difficult and how cruel fantasy football can be, but nothing drives it home more than a list of players who are barely owned, who Probably could have kicked your team's ass this week. Let's look at it. Quarterback, Desmond Ritter, 5% owned. He's been dreadful this season, 26.16 fantasy points. At running back, Jordan Mason, who could have come up to you and introduced himself as Jordan Mason this week, and you wouldn't have known he was the running back for the San Francisco 49ers, 1% owned, 12.9 fantasy points. Emery DeMicardo. Kind of sounds made up, but he is an actual person who put up actually 11.7 fantasy points despite only being 1% owned this week. At wide receiver, Curtis Samuel, 12.5 fantasy points. He's 17% owned. DJ Chark, remember him? 
12% owned, still in the league, 10.2 fantasy points. At tight end, Logan Thomas, 15% owned, 11.7 fantasy points. Our flex, Craig Reynolds, 1% owned, 11.2 points. On the defensive side, I don't know how, but the Giants put up 12 fantasy points against the Dolphins at 2% owned, and Greg Zerline, 4% owned, 18 fantasy points, 126 0.36 fantasy points from a team who the highest owned player is Curtis Samuel. Fantasy football is very, very cruel. All right, let's get into some hockey talk. The Winnipeg Jets making a move um, yesterday, signing Mark Shifley and Connor Hellebuck to matching seven-year contracts um, with an AAV of around eight and a half, I believe it is. I forgot to write it down, but... There's a lot of discussion on these because the, the Jets seem to have kind of stalled for, you know, lack of a better pun. Um, it has been very frustrating for Jets fans that the last couple of years, I would imagine. And now you're kind of locked into this. So from a, a Jets fan perspective, I can understand it because it, it does kind of feel like from the outside, you're kind of locking into first round exits for the next little while. But these are two star level players, I think, in the National Hockey League. Shifley is not going to get many Selkie votes in his career, but offensively, he has a high-end game. He is also someone who connects with the community, which it maybe shouldn't, but it does matter, um, especially in a place like Winnipeg. And he is someone who, like, you are not going to replace that in free agency in Winnipeg for less money than, than Shifley is making. So for a team that kind of wants to stay relevant, he is, I, I think, still a difference maker in the National Hockey League, especially on the offensive side of things. And Connor Hellebuck is just simply the best goalie in the league. Um, is that going to hold for seven years? Probably not. But he is among the best in the NHL. And I think, like, this is a contract that, should probably look good for most, if not all of it. So it, it looks a bit like overpays, that the term is certainly intimidating, but I actually think the Jets kind of did all right. Um, reminder, the NHL season starts today. Um, as I'm recording this, it's a couple hours from now. Um, if you want more on the NHL, we have our preview podcasts on the East and the West up right now. Um, so you can check those out. All right, let's get into today's ticket. Four games on today's ticket. Uh, up first, the Houston Astros taking on the Minnesota Twins. The Astros desperately need a win, and Sonny Gray is out on the mound. I thought Sonny Gray was very vulnerable, and the Blue Jays let him off the hook in Game 2 of the American League Wildcard Series. The Astros are not a team that lets you off the hook. I, I think the Astros are going to come out here and do some real damage against Sonny Gray. I think they jump on him early and often. I think the Astros have the right approach to, to go at a Sonny Gray, so I think it's just a bad matchup for the Twins. I think the Astros, they're the underdogs in this game at plus 110. Sticking with baseball, I'm going the Orioles plus 123. I just don't think they get swept. Um, I don't love the pitching matchup for them tonight, quite frankly, but I just don't see this team getting swept. So I have Baltimore winning this one. And then we got two on the ice tonight. Tampa Bay uh, just straight up to win. Minus 150 against the Preds. And I think the Pittsburgh Penguins are quite a bit better than Chicago. So I'm going Penguins minus a goal and a half. That is today's ticket. And that is today's show. Thank you all so much for tuning in. If you're watching the video, uh, like, subscribe, and leave a comment. If there's anything you agree with or disagree with on the show, leave a comment. That always helps. Rate, review, subscribe wherever you can when you're listening in podcast form. Coming up on the show tomorrow, CFL Power Rankings. We will have some baseball thoughts and a, a couple of thoughts on the night one from the National Hockey League. Thursday, we are getting into NFL Power Rankings, and then Friday, it's a Fights and Football Friday. Also, NBA previews are going to be starting up this week as well. So, as always, lots to get into. Thank you all so much for tuning in today, and I will talk to you all later.